Amen. So keep your place in Matthew chapter 3. So we're continuing our Baptist Basics series this evening, and tonight we're going to talk about baptism. We're going to talk about the doctrine, the practice of baptism. So baptism in the Bible, you know, is one of two ordinances in the church. By ordinance, you know, I mean commands, you know, the things that the church um, deals with, things that the church um, does, things that the church does, that, and things that we should do in obedience to Christ. So in Matthew chapter 3 here, we see the first mention in the New Testament of baptism. And if you look down at verse number 5, we see here where the Bible says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now turn to Luke chapter 3, and we'll look at another um, view of this, another writing of this. But we're going to talk about you know, just some basics of what baptism is this evening. Um, we'll read you um, the first mentions of it right now, and then we'll talk about what it is, why we do it, what it means, and just give us a good picture of what baptism is and why it's such a big deal in the Bible. And you know, we'll also look at you know, some things that other people have done to baptism, other religions, other um, you know, you know, denominations, whatever you want to call it, have done with baptism, and I'll show you um, the falsehoods of those things as well. So look at Luke chapter 3, and look at verse number 2. So we're looking at just the first mentions of baptism here. We see John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, again in Luke chapter 3, and the Bible says in verse number 2 of Luke chapter 3, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So I want to point out the difference here. You see a little bit more detail here on, in Luke chapter 3 of you know, why John the Baptist was doing this, you know, why he was doing this practice, what was going on. And we see in verse 2 that the word of God came unto John the Baptist in the wilderness. Okay? So basically, you know, we see this is kind of a, a modus operandi of God with his, his main men, his main prophets. He did the same thing with Paul in Arabia. He took Paul into Arabia for three years. Here we see that John, you know, John wasn't just in the wilderness, you know, wandering around, you know, eating bugs. You know, God was, the word of God came to him. God was teaching him in the wilderness. And this is part of the things that God was teaching him. Very similar to Paul. Look at verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan. So after the word of God came to John and he was taught by Jesus, you know, he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of Esaias the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So it's a prophecy fulfilled as well. But the point I'm trying to make is this didn't just come out of nowhere. This was a practice that was taught to John by Jesus. Okay, this was taught to John by Jesus. The word of the Lord, the word is Jesus. You know, Jesus is the word become flesh, came to him in the wilderness. He did not just start doing it because it was something different or he thought it was a good idea or it seemed interesting. This was a specific thing that he was taught to do. Okay, so what is it? We see that it was mentioned, it was taught to John, and John started doing it here, you know, in preparing for the kingdom of God, preparing for the coming of Jesus, preparing the way for Jesus. What is it? So turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to give you three Old Testament references that the Bible gives us for baptism. I'm going to give you three, you know, and then we're going to look at each one of those, and it'll, each one of those individual references to the Old Testament will give you a clue or, or give you a little bit of information on what baptism is and why we do it. Okay, so turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now there's a lot in these four verses that I'm going to read. We're just going to focus on baptism. Okay, there's a lot of doctrine in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 18. But this practice, you know, the Bible teaches that there are pictures of baptism in the Old Testament. We're going to look at three of them tonight. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, we see the first one. The Bible says in verse 18, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which, sometimes, which sometime were disobedient, 
when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what the Bible is saying here is that the flood of water is a picture of baptism. And it's a picture of these eight souls, they were saved by water. I mean, they were physically saved by the water. Okay, they literally did not die, and they were saved in the ark. And it's comparing that physical salvation, and it has to do... So this gives us a clue that baptism has to do with your physical life on earth. It has to do with your physical life, your physical walk on this earth. Baptism is, you know, it would be confusing if in verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us, if we didn't have the parentheses right after it. Okay, but the parentheses right after it, because a lot of people teach, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy that one in a few minutes, but a lot of people teach that baptism is part of salvation. This is one of the verses that they will use, because it says the words, baptism doth now also save us. But in parentheses, literally right after that phrase, it says that not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. So we see that it's a picture of the flood of that physical salvation, the saving of their lives. The saving of their lives, and that baptism is an answer of a conscience, a good conscience, towards God. It's one of the first works that you will see that you are supposed to do after you are saved, after your spiritual salvation. Okay? So it's something that you are to do with this grace that you've been given. So that's what 1 Peter chapter 3 is talking about. It's comparing that, that first, you know, that, that salvation, that physical salvation of those eight souls on the ark, Noah's family, with your physical action towards God, your, your, your action of a good conscience towards God in your life. Your works. Your works. It's one of the first works that you'll do. So it's like, hey, I'm gonna, it's you saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something with this grace that I've been given. It's a picture of that. Okay? Of your physical salvation. Look, and when you go and you live and you become a disciple, that is you physically doing things for the Lord. That's you physically working for the Lord. It's not your spiritual salvation. It's your answer of a good conscience towards God is what that is. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we see that it's, it's about your physical life on this earth from the 1 Peter chapter 3. The second Old Testament reference is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we're going to look at this evening. And look at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And, all, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Of course, they followed um, you know, the cloud, and then you know, they went through the Red Sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all eat the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. More evidence of salvation always being the same, the gospel always being the same by the way, even in the Old Testament. But the Bible says in verse number 2, they were baptized unto Moses. They all ate the same spiritual meat and drank the same spiritual drink, showing that baptism identifies you with a local group of believers. Baptism identifies you with a local group. Just like baptism identified these people together as they went through um, what they were going through, this is, you know, the local group. And this is why, by the way, Jesus decided to be baptized by John. You know, he wanted to be baptized by John, showing his accord with John. Turn to, turn to Leviticus chapter 16. And we'll look at the third Old Testament reference. The third Old Testament reference, let's look at Leviticus. So we see so far that it has to do with our physical action. Our physical action in our lives after we're saved, and I'll show you that it's after salvation in a little bit, but 
after we're saved, it's our physical response, you could say, our physical response of a good conscience towards God, meaning we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use this grace. We're not going to take advantage of this grace and turn away from God. We're going to, you know, it's that grace may abound, because grace will abound, but we're going to have a good conscience towards God and, and show that physical action. Number two, we see that as they were baptized unto Moses, you're baptized, you know, it shows that you're in accord with a local group of believers. Okay, it shows that you're in accord. Turn to Leviticus chapter 16. Look at verse number three. The third one is this. Look at verse number 3 of Levit Leviticus 16. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his flesh in water and so put, some, put them on. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1. So before the offering for sins was given, Aaron was supposed to you know, wash himself in water. The priest was supposed to do this before the sacrifice. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's a washing of the priest, but here's the thing. In the New Testament, the Bible says that if you're saved, you are a priest. And this is another Baptist basic that we'll get into in a few weeks, talking about the priesthood of the believer. But look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 6. The Bible says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Look, if you are saved, you are a king and a priest, the Bible says. So this is again a picture of the cleansing that has taken place. So your baptism is a picture of the cleansing. The priest was cleansing. You are a priest. It's a picture of cleansing that has taken place after you got saved. You're cleansing from sin. So we see that it, number one, it, uh, number one, it is uh, a picture of your physical conscience, your action towards God. It is a picture of you identifying with a local group of believers. And number three, it is, you know, a picture of your washing, of your cleansing from sin that has taken place already. Now, it also is, by the way, I'm not going to really dig into this too much because I think this one's pretty obvious, actually. But baptism is is done, the practice of baptism is immersion, by the way. It is complete immersion in water. You see nothing other than that in the Bible. The, word, the Greek word for baptism actually means eat to immerse. I mean, I don't know, you know how you can get you know, any more clear than that. I mean, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, they went down into the water. You know, they were baptizing in a river. You know, John was baptizing in the Jordan River. I mean, if all you had to do was sprinkle somebody, why didn't they just do it in town? You know, why not just do it anywhere? But they did it in a river. Jesus came up out of the water. It's immersion. It's very clear in the Bible. And, you know, the sprinkling, honestly, it just came from Catholics and Protestants and who hijacked baptism, who added baptism to salvation, and quite frankly, it's just lazy. It's just, it's just easier to have a little thing up here, you know, that you can call holy water, and you're just like, and that's, bap you know, I mean, look, they, made, they turned it into something it wasn't. Why not do it the way we want to do it? I mean, whatever. It's just, it's just laziness. It's convenient. They hijack baptism. It's easier just to sprinkle people. But, I mean, it means to immerse somebody, and that's how it is done. So, that's what baptism is. That's what it pictures in the Old Testament, we see some examples there. Who is baptism for? Turn to Acts chapter 8. Who is baptism for? Who, who's to get baptized? Should we all get baptized? Should everybody get baptized? Should we just, you know, go around, you know, baptizing everybody? I mean, what are we supposed to, you know, what does the Bible say about this? Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse number 26. Very famous story in the Bible, but it's very clear on who is to be baptized here. And this is why the, these types of the stories are in the Bible to teach us this doctrine. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go to the south, unto the way that go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, 
an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of, e of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he read Esaias the prophet. When the spirit, the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, Isaiah in the Old Testament and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the Ethiopian eunuch replies, and he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. He's reading the prophecy of Jesus, of the coming Messiah, in the Old Testament. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? He's saying, who's this about? What is this, this, you know, this person that's going to come and make this sacrifice, this Messiah? What is it about? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus, explaining the gospel to him, explaining that, you know, Jesus came and who the Messiah was, what Jesus did. You know, we don't know exactly how he, he did it, but he explained who Jesus was and that Jesus was this Messiah that he was reading about. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He's saying, Here's water. He just preached the gospel to him. He's like, Here's water. Why, you know, I mean, I'm sure he explained, you know, what John the Baptist was doing, preaching the kingdom of God. And he's like, well, I need to be baptized now. I want to be baptized. He's like, what would stop me from being baptized, is what he says. And in verse 37, the Bible says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Well, basically, another way of saying that is, if thou have believed on Jesus, thou mayest. He's saying, if you've trusted on Jesus, Jesus, thou mayest. And he answered and said, the, the eunuch answers and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe the gospel that you just preached me. That's what he just said. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into, in, into the water. Once again, they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Acts 8.37 is the key verse here. It's really the key verse in the whole Bible on who is to get baptized. Okay, it's really the key, which is why, by the way, it's removed from so many Bibles. You think a, a, a super important verse like this that would basically prove that you can't baptize babies that, you know, have not believed on Jesus. You know, I mean, obviously uh, an infant cannot believe on Jesus. You cannot preach the gospel to an infant and have them believe on Jesus. But look, that's why you have to get rid of that verse. You have to take that verse away, and then you just simply misquote a couple other verses that I'll show you, and all of a sudden you can attach baptism to salvation, and now people have to come to your church to get saved. I mean, it's kind of brilliant, really, especially if you're in the business of getting people in your church. Hey, you want to be saved? You better get come here. We, we dish out baptism here, folks. Look, do you want your kids to go to hell? You better bring them here and get baptized. I mean, look, the, the Catholic Church at times... I don't know, they probably still do it in other places around the world, but they would not even bury a child that died and that was not baptized. You know, they would tell people that child is, you know, in, I don't know what they call the, you know, the, the middle place or some, you know, I've, I've heard even Lutheran pastors saying that, look, I, I've, I've told some of you this before, but Lutherans believe that if a child dies and it's not baptized, and Catholics believe this too, that child goes to hell. That's what they believe. Because baptism saves you until you're old enough to believe and then keep your own salvation. It's really confusing. But the whole thing is that, look, I mean, while that child is growing up to be an adolescent or whatever, it's that baptism that injects that faith into them that saves them. I mean, this is why when I was a Lutheran and my children were born, they were baptized right after they were born in the hospital. Most Lutherans... Wait three or four or five weeks, get a little dress, have a big party, get a cake, and all this kind of stuff, and have a baptism thing, have all the family come into town. Are you kidding me? I'm going to wait five weeks and risk my child going to hell? I don't think so. I was the only Lutheran I knew that actually believed this stuff. 
I really believe the false doctrine. But at least I was, you know, if we're going to be in, let's be in. I mean, thank God for the truth, but here's the thing. I mean, baptism, you, verse 37, you have to have a King James Bible. Who would read a Bible that goes verse 36, verse 38? But that's what, that's, I mean, you know, but here's the thing. They don't read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't want to know what it says. They're just listening to what people say. So Acts 37 shows us that baptism happens after you are saved. Baptism is a believer's, you know, once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are sealed in a moment, then you're to be baptized. That's it. So that leads us to this final point that I want to really hit some parts here is, is this. Does baptism save you? Does baptism save you? Because look, or, or is it part of salvation? Is it like, you know, a Lego kit and one of the pieces is baptism? Let, let's look at it. One of the co most common verses, I just heard this a couple weeks ago out soul winning, one of the most common verses used on baptism saving you is Acts 2.38. Turn to Acts 2, verse 38. Look what the Bible says in Acts 2 and verse number 38. The Bible says, And Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and, you or she shall, and ye shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. So right there, it says you need to turn from all your sins and get baptized and you're saved. Is that what that says? That is not what that says. What it says is repent. There's your belief right there. Repent means change your mind. Repent means turn from what you used to believe to what you should believe. It means believe the gospel. That one word is how you get saved right there, by repenting. By repenting, by turning from whatever it is that you believed before to the truth of the gospel. That's it. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ. So it says, repent and be baptized. Turn to Mark chapter 16. There's other verses that say the same thing. Turn to Mark chapter 16 and look at verse 15. So it says, repent and be baptized. Repent meaning believe. Believe the gospel. Mark 16, look at verse 15. Let me just wait for you to get there. Because this is a... Uh, it's important that we understand this point. The Bible says again in Mark 16, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So first of all, verse 16 is used by many people. They just use the first part of that verse to say that you've got to be baptized to be saved. Because he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I mean, but look, look what it says after that. But he that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't say baptize not. So let's apply it. Look, let's apply some logic here. Let's apply some logic just to this statement and to the statement in Acts 2.38. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that true? Is that true? I mean, you're all saved, you all believe the gospel, that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. If you believeth and are baptized, are you saved? Amen. If you believeth, let's try another one. If you believeth and install carpet for a living, are you saved? Amen. If you believeth and eat turkey on Saturday, are you saved? Amen. Yes, you are, right? How about this one? If you believeth and go fishing, are you saved? These are all true statements. These are all true statements. Now, look, if I said, he that eateth not turkey on Saturday is damned. Now we have a problem. But that's not what the Bible said. The Bible did not say, the Bible did not say that if you're not baptized, you're damned. It did not say that. It just said, he that believeth not, as a matter of fact, that one verse proved that it's by belief only by that second part of the verse. Turn to John chapter 3. Here's another one. Here's another one. So just, I mean, just simple logic. Simple logic. And remember this. Remember this as we read the rest of these verses and the rest of these stories in the Bible. Remember this. The whole Bible has to be true. If you're reading something in the Bible that makes other parts of the Bible untrue, you're reading it, you're, you're interpreting it wrong. Because they, otherwise, it, either you're interpreting it wrong or the Bible has contradictions in it. The Bible doesn't have contradictions in it. Turn to John chapter 3. Here's another one. 
John chapter 3, look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. See, you have to be baptized or you can't go to heaven. See, it just said it right there. John 3, 5. You have to be baptized to be saved. Well, first of all, there's two problems here, okay? The first problem is, what did I just say? The whole Bible has to be true. This is in John chapter 3 and verse number 5, which is very ironic because the first one is, is that if John chapter 3 and verse number 5 meant you had to be baptized to be saved, that would directly contradict not only dozens of other places in the Bible, but John 3.15, John 3.16, John 3.18, and John 3.36 in the same chapter. Not only would the Bible contradict itself, John chapter 3 would contradict itself several times, actually. So what do we do when we see a verse being used for something? When we see what's our, what's our first step in our methodology of understanding things? What do we do? We just read a few verses before it and a few verses after it to get the context. So look, the same chapter in the Bible would contradict itself if John 3, 5 meant you had to be baptized to be saved. Okay, John 3 would just be, it would be a mess. Instead of one of the best chapters in the Bible, it would be a contradictory mess is what it would be. But let's look at it. Let's look at the whole thing. I mean, just imagine this. I mean, imagine the most famous book ever written. Imagine the most famous popular book ever written that was miraculously preserved for thousands of years and, you know, is claimed inerrancy and, you know, scholars can't find errors in it and, you know, all of a sudden just like one chapter just contradicts itself like six times. It, it doesn't make any sense. But look, the whole conversation, I'm going to show you something. The whole conversation in John chapter 3 that we're going to look at wouldn't make any sense if John chapter 3 verse 5 meant you have to be baptized to be saved. So let's look at the whole conversation here. First, let's look at it correctly. Let's look at it correctly. Let's look at the first, the first verses before it and a few verses after. Look at verse number 1 of John chapter 3. Jesus is having a conversation with a Pharisee here and he's trying to explain a very specific comment that he makes to this man. Verse number 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He says, look, look, we know, we know that you're from God. Or at least Nicodemus knows that he's from God. And he's saying, look, he's like, you, the miracles that you do, you could never be able to do these if, if it didn't come from God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All the following verses are going to be Jesus explaining verse number three. All the following verses are going to be Jesus explaining, because Nicodemus is completely confused from verse number three. He's like, you need to be born again, Jesus says to him. Look, we understand, but let's just pretend like we don't understand what Jesus was talking about here. Jesus is like, you must be born again or you can't see the kingdom of God. Look, you must be born again or you can't go to heaven, is what Jesus just said. Look at verse number four. Then Nicodemus, he's confused. He says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is confused about this second birth that Jesus is talking about. Look, if you're born again, how many times have, have each of you been uh, physically born here? Once. If you're born again, how many times are you born? One plus two. You're born twice. If you're born physically and then you're born again, that's twice. Nicodemus is confused. How could I be born again when I'm old? So Jesus, you know, starts explaining what it means to be born again. He's talking about, and Jesus said, or Nicodemus even says, the first birth is the physical birth. From your mother's womb, he's talking about. Look at verse number, then we see verse number five. Okay, now we see verse number five. Jesus answered, verily I say unto you. So we're talking about two births. Nicodemus is saying the first birth is your physical birth. How could you have a second birth? Are you supposed to go back into your mother? Into your mother's womb? How is that, how is that even possible? Then look at verse number five. Jesus answered, verily, verily. That means truly, truly. 
I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. There's two births right there. There's two births. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what are the two births that Jesus just explained? Water and the Spirit. So the physical birth and the spiritual birth is what Jesus is explaining. Water is the physical birth. Water is the first birth that Nicodemus brought up in verse number 4. The Spirit is the spiritual rebirth, the second birth, thus the term born again. Look at verse number 6. And then you say, okay, what? But then Jesus just slams it home again. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. The flesh equals the, spirit, or is the physical birth, and the Spirit is the spiritual birth. The birth again, being born again. So there's two births. They're, they're, both of these men are talking about two births. Your physical birth, and then your spiritual rebirth. Being born again. Water and the Spirit is those two births. It's the physical and it's the spiritual. It's the only, now, but let's read verse number five. Now let's try to understand it the wrong way. Now let's read, knowing the conversation, let's read verse number five and let's, let's, let's pretend that it's baptism that it's talking about. Let's read it. Now that we know the whole conversation, Nicodemus being explained, you know, there's the physical birth that we all went through. How could you be born again? And Jesus says, it's spiritual. It's a spiritual birth. But knowing that conversation, let's read verse 5 as if it is talking about baptism. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, I guess that's baptism, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in verse number 5, we have two births, water and the Spirit. One being baptism, the water, right? Because water must be baptism. Because it says water. Water being baptism, and one being the Spirit. So, you know, which is weird because it, the, the Spirit follows baptism. So this would mean you're baptized and then you're saved. Or you're granted salvation after you're baptized. People teach that. But look, we have two births in verse number five. One is baptism, and one is the Spirit. But now, combine that with your physical birth. Now we have three. Now we have three births. We have the baptism, we have the spirit, and we have your physical birth. We have three births. Then verse number six, when he says the flesh is the flesh and the spirit is the spirit, now we're back to two births again. It doesn't make any sense. You can't make it fit. You can't shove it in there. Verse five, look, verse five, this will help people understand it that believe this, but verse five, all you need to do is just put a little emphasis on the word and in verse number five, and it, and it, you know, it will clear this up for people. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, after he explained the physical birth, the spiritual birth, he says, Verily, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So saying, look, you've got to be born physically, just like you said, Nicodemus. Yes, every man is born physically. Every person is born physically. But you have to be born physically and spiritually. That's what Jesus is saying. It's very simple, and it's very, it's very clear, and guess what? It, it lines up with the rest of John chapter 3, and it lines up with the rest of the entire Bible. There's your, there's your, your clue that you've got it right. Okay, look, baptism, you know, you can put the emphasis on the word and, or you can just read the whole conversation, and, and it's very clear, right? So look, that's how you're born again. It's spiritual. It's spiritual, Nicodemus. No, you're not going to go back into your mother's womb. It's a spiritual rebirth. That's, what Je that's, the, that's the conversation in these six verses. So, baptism is a command. It has nothing to do with salvation, as we can see. Uh, that's why you have all these verses. Look, all these verses, if it had anything to do with... You can destroy baptism having anything to do with salvation by all the verses that say, I mean, I mean what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I mean, you think they would have mentioned it. I mean, you think, I mean, if there's two things I got to do to be saved, and you leave 50% of them off, boy, that's bad. That wouldn't even make the Bible. I mean, this book is, is perfect. It's inerrant. That statement would not be true. John 3.15, John 3.16, where it just says, believe on. John 3.36, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It doesn't mention baptism. That would not be true. Just logic. These verses would not be true. If you had to believe on the Son and be baptized to be saved, you could not say, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Because there would be people that believe on the Son and aren't baptized. And, and they wouldn't have everlasting life. If I mean, it's not true. It's just simple logic. It's simple logic. So what do we see? Baptism is command. It's something we do in obedience to Christ. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. The first thing that it's, you know, it's the first thing that we should do. And look, if you've not been scripturally baptized after salvation, a lot of people, a lot of people may have been in a Pentecostal church, they may have been in a Protestant church of some kind, they may have been baptized, baptized, sprinkled as a baby, whatever. This is not baptism. You know, Pentecostals, Catholics, this is why Baptists were first called Anabaptists. Baptists were first, which means rebaptizers. You know, they would go around and they, they, you know, that's one of the reasons that, you know, they never joined the Catholic Church. Baptists never split from the Catholic Church in 300 AD, by the way. They never joined. They didn't go to the council. They didn't want any part of it because they would not give in on these core doctrines of what? Of salvation. They would not give in on these core doctrines. Adding baptism to salvation is works-based salvation. Adding anything, you know, great, you know, belief plus anything is works-based salvation. And Baptists didn't want to have any part of it. So they held the faith and they were called Anabaptists, rebaptizers, because they were still preaching the gospel to people that got baptized as a, or sprinkled as a baby, and then they would scripturally baptize them. So they were given the name of rebaptizers, Anabaptists, you know, kind of as a, you know, as a, as a shun to them, but you've only been scripturally baptized one time. If you're baptized as a child, as a baby, in a Catholic church, you know, if you were sprinkled in a Catholic church or a Lutheran church, and then you get baptized after you get, got saved, you've been baptized one time. That's it. So there's no rebaptism, but that's the name that they were given. That's the name. I mean, they were killed for this. The martyr's mirror that I've read to you a few times is, is the main doctrine that was getting all these people killed. I still have it here. All these people killed the main doctrine, all these people tortured, burned, is baptism, is scriptural baptism. That's how important it is. It's important that, look, that's how important salvation doctrine is. It's worth dying for because it will cost generations down the road. Now this is a witness for us showing us how important this proper doctrine is. They were killed for it. But look, here's another thing. Like all commands in the Bible, baptism has a purpose. We've already discussed three things. After you're saved, you're to be baptized. It's a picture of your answer towards God. You know, your, your good conscience towards God. It identifies you with a local group of believers. And it's a picture of the cleansing that has taken place after you've gotten saved. But the best I've saved for last, turn to Romans chapter 6. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I've saved the best picture for last of baptism. Everything that we do, everything that God commands us to do in the Bible, we should, look, we should just do it, no matter what, just because God tells us to do it. But all these things have a purpose. They're beneficial to us. They, ha they, they show beautiful pictures of the gospel, of Jesus, of God's will for our lives, of, of you know, the Bible tying itself together. Look at Romans chapter 6. I've saved the best picture for last. Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So Paul is preaching that this is just all about grace. You are not saved by your own works. You know, he's like, well, if the law, if the law has no power over me, if the law has no power over me, I'm no longer a servant to sin. I'm no longer a slave to the law. Look, the law cannot send me to hell anymore. And if that's the case, should I just, should I continue in sin? I mean, why not? I'm not going to hell. He said, 
that grace may abound. Grace will abound. Paul knows this. Then in verse number 2, he says, God forbid. He's like, no, he should not do that. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried. Underline that word buried in your Bible. We are buried with Him by baptism into death. Like that as Christ was raised. Now underline that word raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should also walk in what? We should be raised too. This is a picture. Baptism is a picture. As you go, and this is why, by the way, you, when you bury somebody, you just throw a little dirt on them. When you bury somebody, you're just like, it's good. No, you bury them in the ground. The Bible says that baptism is a picture of us being buried with Christ. Of us identifying. As we identify through baptism with a local group, you know who we're really identifying with? We're identifying with the death of Jesus Christ. As we're put under the water, it's a picture of Christ being buried in the grave. And then, are we kept under the water? Are we just like, are you just like does the pastor just hold his hand on your face? And you're like, and he's like. <laughs> Done. No. You're immediately, you're put down, and you're immediately brought back up. And, and, and that's a picture of being raised with Jesus. And Jesus, look, Jesus was raised from the dead. Death had no power over him. He defeated death and the devil. But you are raised to do what? You are raised to walk. Look, walk, that's your works, folks. Your walk, your Christian walk is what you do. It's how you act. It's what you do with the grace. You are raised to walk in newness of life. You're raised up. It's a picture of you not being the same person that you were before you got saved. It's a picture. It's a reminder. Look, God knows we need slaps in the face. How many Christians, how many saved people do you know that are not walking in newness of life? They look, when they walk, if you would see them walk and you would see unsaved people walk, you would not know any difference by the walk. They walk the same. They walk the same. They talk the same. They do the same things. We're not to do that. We are not to just take advantage of and abuse grace. We are not to, you know, disrespect the sacrifice that we look, grace will abound. God will keep his promise. But we're to have a good, I mean, could you, could you have, if you were walking, if you were walking, if you got saved and you were given eternal life and you were sealed in a moment, you have, you have it now. You have everlasting life. And then you're just walking like everybody else in the world walks. And, I mean, you obviously your conscience isn't completely seared. You're con you have a conscience. You have a conscience because you were able to believe the gospel. Somebody that's conscience is completely seared, you know, is, and cannot believe the Pharisees or reprobates or whoever else. Look, they don't even have a, a conscience. God gives everyone a conscience. He writes the law in our heart. Ours is intact. If you got saved, it's intact enough at least for you to believe the gospel. If you were sitting there and you have an intact conscience and you get saved, you take that grace, got mine, and then you walk like everybody else and you say, forget this following God thing, I got mine, could you have a good conscience? Could you have a good conscience towards God? That's how baptism identifies you by raising you up and you, you're supposed to walk in newness of life. So you can have, as 1 Peter chapter 3 says, a good conscience towards God. You can go to bed at night with a clear, yeah, you're, you're still a sinner, but you know what? You, you're, you're walking in newness of life. You're trying to be a disciple. You're trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to, you know, and when people look at you, when people look at you, they're like, you know what? That guy's different. Look, I'm telling you, if people don't look at you and know, if you go and you start a new job, if you go and start a new job, and people, listen to me closely, and people don't notice within the first half an hour that you are different than other people, you are not walking in newness of life. That's how bad it is. 
I mean, this is not like, oh, a little bit different. You should, you should act differently. You should speak differently. You should look differently. People should not, you shouldn't even have to speak by the things that you don't say. People should say that there's something different there. There's something different. They may not know what it is, but they'll know something's different. But too many people, there is no difference. This is what baptism is picturing. This is why God gave us baptism. This is why God commands this ordinance. It's not just, hey, do this because I'm God and I want to just have you puppets do what I want. No, it's for us. It's for us to remind us, just like the other ordinance, the Lord's Supper, to remind us. Look, we need reminders. We need reminders. I mean, otherwise, I mean, there, there'll be no difference. It's a command. It's a picture of our new birth and what we should become. Verse 6 says that. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Look, the, the old man, it gets even better. The old man that used to walk the old way, that was the sinful man that was just embracing all the garbage of this world, that man was crucified on the cross with Jesus. Amen. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we will not serve sin. No, we should not. Amen. We should not. You want a good conscience towards God? Don't serve sin. Amen. Walk in newness of life. It's a picture of our new birth. It's a picture of being born again. I mean, why would you want to be born again and then just be the same that you were? A lot of, way too many people do that. Way too many Christians are, are just taking advantage of that grace. Turn back to Matthew chapter 3. That's why, look, that's why. It's this, it's this idea of this new birth, that you're a new creature. You know, and then people will take this into false doctrine too. They'll say, oh, you know, if, if you're saved, if you're truly saved, you're going to have the works for sure. Look, that's just, a, that's just an end run around works-based salvation. Yeah, that's right. You should do it. If you want a good conscience towards God, you should do it. That's what Paul is saying. You should. It's not just this magical thing, because then it gives people this... This power to say, oh, you don't have the works, so you're not saved. Oh, you know, you still have a problem with this sin, so you're not saved. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a power play. It's a power play. It's false doctrine. It's attaching works to salvation. Look, if you don't come to this church three times a week and, and tell me how great of a preacher I am, like at least six times a week, like, I mean, are you even saved? This is where this stupid stuff goes. It's attaching works to salvation. That you will have the works. You will do whatever I feel like entering into those blanks. That, that's, that's how dumb this gets. But then people buy it. I mean, it's just, look, you should. You should. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. But look, this is why in Matthew chapter 3, look at verse number 6. So here they are. They're getting baptized. They're getting baptized by John. John was taught this doctrine of baptism in the wilderness by Jesus, and they're getting baptized. But look at verse number 6. When he baptized, look what they were doing. Look what they were doing. Baptism, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be raised to walk in newness of life. It's about our walk. It's about a reminder. It's a command by God after we're saved. It's about a reminder of the new birth, the new person, the new creature, and our walk that we're supposed to have that we should have. Look at verse number 6. And were baptized in the Jordan, confessing their sins. These people were getting right. These people were getting right. Do you confess your sins? You should. Do you confess your sins to God? You should. Don't, don't get so, you know, anti, you know, look, it's not part of salvation, but it's a good thing to do. You should be confessing your sins on a regular basis, unless you've somehow figured out how to stop sinning, which you haven't. You should, be, you should be confessing your sins to God. These people were getting baptized. They were confessing their sins. They were getting right. And they were, they were going to walk in newness of life. That's what these people were going to do. Confess your sins. Don't make a mockery of the grace that you've been given. Baptism is a picture. It's a symbol. It's a symbol. It is in the Old Testament. And it's a symbol of our walk that should be 
in grace. Their walk, you know, that, that grace will abound, but we should have the walk. So we're not taking advantage of that grace. And, and look, it's an outward expression that we realize this. It's in, you know, it doesn't get you saved. It doesn't keep you saved. It identifies you with Christ. That's what it does. It identifies you with Christ. You're buried with Him into death. You're raised to walk in newness of life. And it's a symbol of your new life. Which includes this local group of believers. That you are what? Guess what we're all doing together? We're all walking together in this Christian life. We're all walking together. You see how it all fits together? You see how all those Old Testament you know, references that, that was, were brought up in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Peter 3. You see how it all fits together? How we identify with each other through our baptism? How we identify in Christ through our baptism? How we're all, it's a picture of our cleansing together. It's a picture of our cleansing from sin after we've gotten saved. And then really, I mean, it identifies us, you know, with Christ together. But look, we're all walking together. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing in this ministry. We're doing the first works, which, you know, is literally a lot of walking. <laughs> but this is baptism. It's a beautiful picture of what we've been given and what we are to now do. So if you haven't been scripturally baptized, you should be. You know, talk to my wife or talk to me um, about it, and we will get you scripturally baptized. It's very simple. It's an ordinance. It's a command from God. And as you can see... It, it's, it's a very beautiful picture of our salvation and our life, our physical life after salvation. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.